welcome to Third Thursdays. This is our second Third Thursday Studios, and I'd like to say thank you very much for coming and enjoying a lovely evening. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Becky, who's going to ex uh, introduce our program for today. When we were working on the committee, we tried to think of different forms of art that people may not come to individually, but since it was kind of a, an ongoing series, maybe they would come out for it. So what I would like to know tonight is how many poetry fans do we have? Already poetry fans. Now, how many not so much? Yeah. Um, not a poetry fan. Uh, I started out not a poetry fan, and then I was uh, introduced out at the Artist Edge Salon in Sandy to one of our poets who spoke at uh, the salon. And I was really, as a visual artist, captivated by um, what seemed to me listening to an impressionistic painting or an abstract painting, if you could listen to one, because the style of poetry was so different from what I was used to. And, um, and a light bulb came on while I was sitting there deciding if I liked it or not. <laughs> and I, I realized that it was, really in, it was really more like a jigsaw puzzle that you could put together in several ways. And I love puzzles, and so I think you'll find their style very interesting. Uh, and they will be explaining it more, but these two gentlemen that are coming here tonight, I've listened to both of them, and I enjoy both of them. Uh, they come from very different parts of the world, and they're now living in the Portland area. They have a list of awards, achievements, projects, and publications that would take the rest of the evening. So I'm gonna let their words and their work speak for them. And so I'd like you to welcome John Sibley Williams and Anatoly Molokov. Love outlives us like trees. Love outlives us like the air we breathe. We help trees help us. When we breathe our last breath, some tree will notice, convert it to oxygen for other lovers. Love outlives us. Good evening, folks. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Becky, for introducing us. Thanks for the, um, for the venue to the Historical Society. What a beautiful place to read poetry. Um, we um, were told that a lot of you folks were not necessarily going to be familiar with poetry. So as opposed to an average reading, we will talk a little more about the tools of the trade, about what goes on into poetry. And We'll let you guys weigh in on a number of topics. And then at the end, hopefully, you might have some questions for us. So where I wanted to start, as um, um, Becky mentioned, I'm from Russia, so I have a different start with poetry. I know you guys are really kind of screwed in this country because you get to expose yourself to poetry through Shakespeare in school. And I like some of Shakespeare's plays personally, but I would never study them as a young kid in school who's learning what poetry is. Even nowadays, a lot of the time, we run into people who think that poetry is a coded language. That's something that requires studying, something that an average person cannot penetrate. And I think that's a very dangerous position vis-a-vis -vis poetry that we're trying to dispel. Uh, basically, what we think is poetry is just a, just a way of speaking. It's speech. It might not be as obvious and straightforward as 
the speech we use in conversations, but it doesn't have to be perceived as something complex or something that requires an archaic approach or something that requires a translator to understand. So today we'll try to bring, break down some of the poems and see how they work and what makes them normal speech versus some kind of coded language. Um, sometimes there is a, a phenomenon, a social event that you want to speak about, but not directly, because speaking about certain things directly is um, often cliche, because a lot of people have done so already. So sometimes the goal in poetry is to speak in veiled terms. So I'm going to give you an example of a poem, and maybe after I read, I can ask you guys what you think it's about, and then I will share what I think it's about. And any answer is equally right. It's not supposed to mean one thing. So this one is called Stay. Standing on a precipice, you wonder, should you sing or dance? When the earth spins this fast, how many fingers does it take to hold on? When half the world's atmosphere stares you down, how many wings would you need? If silence is split in half, the unsaid and the ignored, will you stay? Will you speak? Will you sing till dawn? Will you dance yourself home? So what do you guys think this poem is about? If anybody wants to volunteer an opinion. Good, good. Um, any other opinions? Okay, I'm going to come out with what I was trying to say here. I was talking about suicide and suicide prevention. I was, I'm, I was trying to imagine a situation in which a person is so oppressed by the world that they perceive a precipice in front of them. And then I was talking about how to avoid that temptation. So uh, maybe a lot of people will not take away that particular meaning. But more than trying to say something specific, a lot of the time a poet will try to say something more general, more abstract, and let the reader inhabit that space and bring their own interpretation. So your interpretation is just as good as mine or anybody's, for that matter, as long as the words give you something and you can take it away and make your own thoughts about it. So the line, sing yourself home, it's even joyous to me. It is, it is. I think that, um, that I'm trying to find joy in, in a situation where maybe you wouldn't think of finding joy, but that's definitely true. Right, and sometimes engaging in emotion and um, commitment and um, dance or singing takes your mind away from whatever uh, you dwell on and, and helps. So um, that's just an example of how a poem can say maybe different things to different people. Uh, um, you come to it with an open mind, you take away whatever you can take. It doesn't have to be deciphered in the sense that you understand what the words say, but what they mean, it's up to a degree, is up to you. At least that's how John and I view poetry. We have um, started an inflectionist poetry movement that is based around poetry that has room for the reader, where you can come in and bring your own interpretation and make it mean something more than the text was originally as it was on the page. I'm going to read another poem that uh, plays with things that we are familiar with, but turns them upside down a little bit to see where we can get with it, what kind of thoughts would generate from this kind of tweaking of things. So I'll let you see what, what you think about it. It's called Safety Instructions. Before you cross the street, look to the left. 
to see if your life is worth living. And then to the right, to check if your future exists. Before you cross the street, look up to make sure that the stars are aligned impeccably. And if it's daytime, may it be sunshine. But on a cloudy day, may your intuition be at its best. Before you cross the street, think of us, the ones intertwined with you. Before you cross the street, close your eyes. So, um, without over-explaining, here's an example of looking at the mundane uh, gesture, crossing a street, and then interpreting it in a different way. How would you interpret crossing a street in a philosophical way? How would you interpret uh, the word yes as a, or no as an answer to a philosophical dilemma? Right. <clears throat> That's true. Well, that could be a matter for, for choice. It could be a matter for, for commitment. Um, so um, that's what we do. We try to say something, but not say it too directly. And I think that's maybe that's what poetry is to a degree. I mean, everybody has their own definition of poetry. Um, uh, in a way, it's similar to reading a novel. If you read a novel, you're not going to take away the same exact understanding as the author meant, or any other reader. Uh, there's so much room there for interpreting in one way or another. Poetry is like that too, it's shorter, but still, it leaves a lot of room for interpretation. Or at least, to me, good poetry does. I don't want to read a poem and be totally clear about what it says. For me, that's, um, that's a robbery. I don't want to come away with nothing if everything's already clear. Um, so I'm going to... Um, probably go in, into that direction that you just uh, named um, and read a few selections from uh, my piece called um, Time and Absence. Uh, these are three short selections and they are perhaps more than anything in, um, uh, expressionist in that you can really you know, put together the words into meanings in your own way. I, I'll, let, I'll let you try that and we'll see what happens. So the, the longer work is called Time and Absence, and there's just three fragments from it. I wrap myself in a cloud and float away like that kiss from years ago. Nothing bothers me. The silence empties itself into the cup of your hand, and time is useless. When nothing remains, I wrap myself in a cloud and float effortless. I'm a map. I'm a memory. I'm a life. I'm a meaning. Have a chance to rust. Have a nice go with it. Let your molecules oxidize. Release control. There will be more of you, more of everyone. Let time envelop you, swallow you, release your atoms, exchange thoughts with laughing water drops. As you acquire color, celebrate silence, remain cheerful as you disappear. A melody doesn't exist all at once. We hear a memory in joy and absence. We pretend that the past is a living reference, that the moments comprising our lives make sense as a whole, that a note ago we were the same, that a song fills our presence, that a chord struck at birth still rings true when we die. We believe that a melody remembers us. So what, do you, uh, what can you say about this, if anybody wants to say or ask something about that? Other than enjoying it tremendously, I would like to know, are you, when, when you write as a poet, does, do you think about, are you writing 
writing it from from your soul? Are you writing it for someone? Um, it doesn't matter. It's a good question. I am. Um, I'm cautious about writing in a way that would be incomprehensible to another person, to a reader, which often happens when an author over relies on a personal experience. If I were to tell you something precisely the way that it happened to me, I feel like that would be a way to alienate you as readers because you might not get the, uh, what the meaning of the same events um, is in the context of my life, I may be too close to the subject of the examination. So, to answer your question, I um, um, try to make sure there is nothing in the text that would be like that, that the reader lacks while I, as the author, have access to. Um, other than that, I just try to make it interesting to the type of reader that I would be. So, the aesthetic is certainly different for any poet, but um, for me, the idea is to make it universally acceptable. I'm, I'm trying to avoid having people look things up or wonder about what the geographical location is or any other kind of stuff. Thanks. That's a great question. When you, when you talk about your, the, poet, the poem that you did with, that related to suicide, there were people here that saw something else. Right. I was writing it for an abstract person who went through it, not a particular person that I know. You just took that subject and decided to, to fall into it? Well, sometimes it starts with certain words. There's a phrase that comes to your mind and just keeps kind of sitting in your head and you want to take it somewhere. Sometimes you don't know at first what it means and it can, it can continue in many different ways. So you kind of build a poem, at least I build a poem one line at a time. Sometimes I don't know where it's going to get me at the end. Sometimes I know the end before I start the beginning. So it's a little different from time to time. But generally, I'm not, um, personally, I'm not um, autobiographical in my writing, both poetry and fiction. I, I like to make things up. I don't like to just narrate what has happened to me in my own life. Of course, you rely on your own experiences to understand other people's experiences, too, but I don't rely primarily on my experience. Thanks for that. First of all, I love the line, I love the reader, and the sense of really love the universal connection with spirit. Thank you. Um, do you create in Russian or English? I started writing in English um, about 20 years ago. I've lived in the States for about 24 now, 20 so um, I converted fairly early in that process. It was just didn't seem to make sense to keep writing in Russian while living in the States. So there we are. So I'm going to read a, com a couple of um, brief poems that illustrate a slightly different sphere of concern. So a lot of what I'm concerned about are grander human problems, death, life, love. But you know, occasionally I'll write a political poem and these two are, so I'll, I'll read these two. This one is called The Scarf. I walk to the market wearing a head scarf. I'm less seen than darkness, less heard than death. I wear women's garb to feel what it means to exist. Religious police, police would be shocked by my beard hidden behind a black fabric. Allah, too, hides his face behind a myth. May our hidden stories shape the future. Second poem is called Dead Child Reframed. It's almost as if the child was never real, the child in the photograph, skeletal, his old eyes somewhere to the left of the photographer where his mother might be 
we can't see her body, but there are flies on it, and the buzz stops you as the photographer winces, puts the landscape on just outside the frame. You imagine yourself that child that could have lived. So, um, in this case, um, it's clear, obviously, what the poem talks about, because um, um, these themes are pretty transparent. Some, sometimes you trade off ambiguity for clarity, and there is a spectrum on which poems operate. Sometimes you want it to be more puzzling, other times you want to just say what you want to say. Um, and. Um, this next poem is called um, A Song. And this, this poem, maybe I'll read it first and then I'll talk about it just a bit. It's uh, called A Song. If you were an icicle, would I melt you or keep you frozen? If you were a mountain, would I set out to climb you or spend my life below? If you were a person, would I speak to you or run in fear? If you were a song, would I hear or sing you? So this poem, obviously, I'm asking strange questions here, questions that sort of don't make sense. And sometimes I find it a, a good poetic tool, talking about things that don't make sense, you suddenly start making sense. And a good way to trigger imagination, if you will. Um, you guys have any questions at this point so far? Cool. Um, well, um, I have um, an example of something slightly longer for you to conclude my part, and then John will continue with like, his lovely poetry. Um, and this is an example of um, a longer piece of work is a series of poems that um, combine into something bigger than a, a bunch of individual poems, or at least that's my hope with creating that. And I've been interested lately in creating these longer poetic works because I, I'm also a fiction writer, so for me it's, um, I suppose, a medium that's in between the two. It's, it, it has some ability to be narrative, but also it, it's poetry. I'll let you guys judge after I read it. It's about a seven or eight minute long piece called Bridges, Shadows, Smiles. We met on the bridge. Did you jump or was it me? I open my eyes. I no longer exist left in that vanished moment, each instant a shadow of the one before. I am a shadow of a shadow I used to be. The stuffed rabbit's sad eyes. Why then the smile on my face? If my arms were a bridge, Blood could travel from my heart right to yours, pausing midway to admire the distance and the way the event horizon curves as my blood cells dance, meeting yours. When I step into the light, my shadow gains strength. My life grows shorter. When we arm wrestle, we lay down our arms. At the end, we shake hands. Our shadows dance. When we sing, we are endless. I grab the knife as if my hand knew more than I did. I said, this blade is best to see your reflection. You smile, the makeup of years on your face like mine. Not everything happens at once. Not every moment is endless. 
my mother walked away from me. The bridge remains suspended outside my reach. My father built a bridge of his own, leading from himself to himself. My lover, a bridge into otherness, floating weightlessly. My child, a bridge into a future I will not share. Bridge is made of water and wax, air and memory. All my life I've been building bridges between bridges. Am I your shadow or are you mine? When I do, do you. When you are, am I. You have three smiles to offer. One years ago, not intended for me, just floating there on the gondola of your lips. The second, when I was leaving, so I may have a chance to come back. I turn my face sideways, so whispers from the past mix with hints from the future, and presence melts into absence less vividly. The third smile is coming still, but I wish I knew if I'm the right person to look for it. <coughs> The bridge between your world and mine is untraveled. We don't know on which river. We have distances to share, connections to cross. The bridge between your world and mine is gold and rusty iron, straw and silver. We have faced each other so long it's hard to imagine the crossing. It's hard imagine. The bridge between your world and mine is not built yet. Building is the easy part. You spill your vision over unspoiled white silence. Shadows disappear. I know something has to change. I know I will remember floating in and out of you like a dream, half longings. Your memory is a shadow looming over mine. On my way to the cemetery, I stop to pick up flowers. The vendor's smile is gentle and distant. And I wonder, would you mind if instead of flowers, I bring that smile to your resting spot. As I stand on the crest of the bridge, the two sides become wings that let me leap from this moment into a fairy tale. Oh, how the water runs as if nothing mattered. Now I can fly like that with careless self-confidence, knowing there is more of me where this came from. But if I reach the ocean, how will I know if it's not just my tear magnified? Just tell me this. Did you return unscathed? Did your ending forgive? The beginning, you hung your shadow on a hook in my anteroom. It welcomed me each time I came in. When monsters got in your way, did you wrestle them one at a time? When you reached the river, did you see the golden city on the other side? Did you count the years? And because I just happened to die waiting for you, just tell me this. Did you survive the journey? Did you return unscathed? Sleepy-eyed and shiny like a small sun, my lover is putting on a pair of socks, puzzles of centuries on the lips. 
I smile unnoticed. We met on the bridge. Did you smile first, or was it I? Were we the shadows? Was I ready to jump, or was it you? Thank you. Thank you, Fox. Our time is g going kind of to a point where I'm going to surrender the stage to John Sibley Williams, and later at the end, if you have more questions, uh, I hope you ask John Sibley Williams. Um, but yes, I want, obviously I wanted to echo Mitha. Thank you so much, of course, for inviting us. It was wonderful to um, in Sandy, I guess it was um, last summer, I think, to to have met you and to and that you've invited us in such a beautiful, beautiful building in the in the series. I know obviously being the first year, and I hope everyone decides to continue doing it. This is amazing. I wish I wish every community, uh, I mean, you know, outside of the city, there's so much going on in the city, and then there's so there's so much uh, so much potential. There's so many interesting people and. Uh, and stories and creators outside of the city that it, it would be wonderful if more communities did this. Um, an honor to be a part of it and to be one of the first uh, two poets involved. Um, before I said it, actually, it was um, interesting you refer uh, when Becky referenced the, uh, not, not liking poetry, right? Not being a fan of poetry. Uh, I uh, also uh, was not a fan of poetry. I don't think anyone is born that way. Um, until I had already been writing it for a few years. Uh, I actually didn't like poetry, actually very much, I think, uh, because of what Anatoly said. In middle school, high school, I was only introduced to the, uh, the greats, the British greats and Shakespeare and such, which maybe you can uh, appreciate more later, but it's very difficult at that age to wrap your mind around that, uh, as opposed to it being uh, presented either, either it's uh, maybe the creative process be, or, um, something that I'll discuss later, but the importance of re remaining like a child on some level, I think it's where a lot of poetry comes from. The, the curiosity, the uh, unlearning of things, I think, and myself included, uh, even in my mid-30s, when I look at a tree, I, I see a tree, and I actually have to, and it's been f 15 years of trying to untrain myself to see what I'm seeing, to kind of try to open the door to what else I might be seeing, what else is within the thing that's in front of me. It's very difficult, and that um, is not easy to do when one is approaching uh, the greats of literature. Uh, so I didn't actually start uh, writing poetry until uh, I think I was about 21, 22, having never read a word of it, never enjoyed a word of it. Uh, I didn't even know it was poetry, and I just felt like writing something one day, and I wasn't sure what it was, and I, um, I was on a beach, actually, when I lived in, in New York, and I didn't know what to do, so I got a marker and I just started writing some, I didn't have paper, I, you know, not being a writer at the time, I didn't know I was supposed to have paper and a pen on me at all times. So I actually just started writing in ink on, on me and I was just like, uh, 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 and then, and then and just kind of upset down, whatever. And, uh, just, and I didn't know what it was, it was very silly and I still have it uh, saved in my computer. Um, uh, you know, a little silly thing, but, uh, but still. And you know, I had to run back to the car and kind of look you know, angle the mirror so I could see, you know, what I'd, what I'd written. And then I wrote it down on a piece of paper and then went home and later and typed it. And I didn't call it a poem, I didn't know what it was, but it, it looked like a poem, it didn't have a plot or characters, and I, it took a while. But uh, I didn't end up, I wrote for a while and, and it was um, pretty terrible, and uh, until I started reading poetry. And that's when I uh, both, um, but in, I think most people come the opposite. You know, that you, you have an appreciation for poetry and you think maybe I'll have, uh, I'll, I'll try my hand at writing it. And for me, it was the polar opposite. Um, so for at this uh, to be through, more than half of my life, I also felt the exact same way. And, uh, but uh, my process was, was the opposite, I think, of most, where I enjoyed writing it before I actually enjoyed it. I don't know if I enjoyed reading what I had read, <laughs> written even. Uh, obviously, that's not the case anymore. Um, but I think I wanted to start, um, didn't plan on saying that, but it was just, it, I, felt the same, I felt the exact same way. I, we're, we're very much taught, I, I feel, our, our students, our children, this is, couldn't be more important, uh, are taught incorrectly in terms of the creative arts, 
uh, maybe not a lot of others, and some schools, I'm sure, are very different. But that idea of, of maybe having, potentially even writing poetry before having them read poetry, you know, um, almost more of a, in a workshop format, you know, as opposed to being taught what a limerick was. I could write a limerick, I didn't like writing a limerick, but that idea of actually having them enjoy what they're doing without having to name what it is, you know, here is a sonnet, okay, that's good. Um, as opposed to recognizing the forms later and actually having the personal desire to do the thing first. Um, and um, yeah, uh, so in this, the first poem uh, that I wanted to read, um, it's not, none of the uh, poems in this particular book are titled, they're numbered, but this, um, this is the first poem in the book and it, it speaks to me a lot about my, my, uh, my thoughts on poetry and creativity in, in general, uh, which is why I wanted to start with it. <clears throat> I see a man on an adjacent building, silhouette cut from the skyline. So I also cut out the roof he stands on. I cut out the tools and the cascading shingles. I cut out the hydrangeas the shingles decapitate on their way down. I cut out the mountain in the distance, still coddling its last snows replacing it with a silo, the shingles with paper snowflakes. I replace the man with another man, with a woman, with a horse, a piano, with a book, and myself. But nothing quite fits. But the man no longer fits either, or the roof, or skyline. And I wonder, is this what it means to touch? Um, the reason I say that that um, has, I guess, something to do with my overall creative uh, and uh, poetic approach is that although it does come on some level from personal experience, I have very much backed it out. You would never know from this. Um, but that actually is a true story. Uh, in that I was sitting on a porch one day in my apartment here in Portland soon after I moved here, and uh, I had a view of Mount Hood, and there was a gentleman on the roof next door, and he was doing some work and ripping up shingles. And to me, I, I was sitting there trying to write a poem, and I, and I realized I didn't know what to say about anything that's going on around me. So I wondered what would happen if the things that were, the, the things that I were witnessing, if they weren't those things anymore. So for example, I started, you know, so I, I saw the mountain, it was Mount Hood, and I was just, okay, so if it's not Mount Hood anymore, and I literally went like this, so I couldn't see it anymore. And I was like, so if that's not Mount Hood, what could I put in its place? So I was like, okay, so I can picture my mother's from the Midwest. So I was like, okay, so I'm picturing a silo being there. How would that, you know, kind of change the landscape? And I was kind of playing around with things like that. Uh, and then I was like, okay, so if that's not a gentleman right there that's on, on the roof, then what else could he be? What, what if it were me? What if it were, uh, you know, a horse? Kind of silly, but... Um, the uh, shingles that were falling down, what if they were actually snowflakes? And suddenly, each one of those little changes changes kind of the landscape in front of me. But then I, you know, um, returned to what was in front of me uh, in reality, and I realized none of those things looked the same anymore because I had done something to them, if that makes sense, just purely creatively, because I had, in my mind, manipulated and replaced the different things that were around me. When I returned to what really was around me, it wasn't the same as it was before. I had, uh, I had touched it somehow. You know, there's some sort of conversation going on, and I still don't have the words for it. But on some level, that's how I approach both the creation of poetry and reading it. Um, and in that regard, it's, um, I guess it's, it has, it has a, to me, it has a lot to do with touch. It has a lot to do with what changes when, when two things collide. And that could be, um, it could be meaning because of, uh, ambiguity, for example, you're a careful selection of words. <clears throat> and given that a, a certain word perhaps means something to me, it might mean something very different to someone else. Um, and because of that, there's actually kind of a collision, there's a spark in between the different interpretations of a certain word, a certain phrase. Maybe a, maybe a certain flower brings you back to a certain point in your life. To me, it means death, for example, or you know, classically, it means X, Y, Z. Um, and because of that, that's, there's actually a spark, and to me that's where the most beautiful part of poetry comes from, honestly, is, is, the, is the spark, is where two things are actually grading together and creating something new. 
You know, it, it's, it is no longer uh, a tree uh, necessarily. It could be a thousand other things. Yet somehow all those thousand other things are still the tree, if that makes any sense. I don't want to go too far out there. Um, so that would bring back to the idea of the universal in poetry. The idea of um, that, that kind of war, that spark between the personal, which everyone writes from regardless of if you're trying to write a very conceptual poem, you're still writing something personal and you can't help that, versus universal, like versus audience. You know, how do you write, for, take something inside and bring it outside so that it will resonate with others? Um, and to me, it's that idea of conversation. Um, there are all these dialogues going on at the same time between the reader and the writer. You know, the, to me, that's the most important thing. Who is reading it is an active participant in all of this. It's not just you're writing something, here you go, world. Um, the person, the, per, the interpretation is, if anything, three quarters of it. So to me, the idea of writing hope, uh, writing trying to think about how other people will interpret it is very important. You know, that you select an image knowing that other people will think different things about this image, why, which is why, like what Anna Tolley said, for me also, I don't tend to use um, too many place-specific names because that narrows it down in a way that another person, um, they can only have the, perhaps the experience that I'm portraying. I'm driving down route X, Y, Z, and the person's like, yes, I've done that too. They're actually on that road, and I would prefer them to be on any road. I would prefer them to be on a road from their childhood if they so desire, depending on what that brings to them. Um, so I, uh, I selected a, a poem or two here that um, I felt um, was, I guess you could say, uh, I, I think I called it um, unpersonalizing the personal, of uh, being able to, st uh, trying to step back from actual experience to hopefully open up a door so that, other, that it will speak to other people also. Um, and before doing that, I wanted to ask quickly, what, do you, what makes a poem, or I guess you could say another piece of art, what makes that universal? What makes, the, what makes a, a creation resonate with a total stranger who has never met the poet, who has never you know, met the artist? What makes something universal? I'm looking at you because you're, 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 you're like... selfish and I want to make this work for me at this particular time in my life, you know, this, this particular, I don't know, emotion that I'm having. And, um, and so that's what I was doing with the poem that you just read. I thought, I don't know, is that his? I don't know. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm following it with, with my sequence of events that are happening with me now. So in answer to, for me, in answer to your question is that I, I sequence what you're doing. And, and if that sequence doesn't work for me, then I think I might... I might go off on my own tangent, but mm -hmm. um, for it to mm -hmm. resonate with me, it's, it's the things that you're saying can be followed. Mm -hmm. that, that's wonderful, and I, I think, um, no, no, it is, especially with where you went from it. The fact that, I like the fact that you didn't, uh, you didn't necessarily know if I was reading just someone else's or if it was mine. I actually uh, like that because that moved you from you trying to, you were trying to place what was going on in the poem kind of on me, like you, were, it's on, you started by wondering you know, what I would be doing in that, and then not knowing if it was mine or not, you moved into, okay, well, I'm gonna try to make this my own. And that, to me, is the whole purpose of it, honestly. I, I often, when I'm reading poetry, um, I'll have more than one book in front of me, and I'll read different poems from different books. I actually don't like being too connected to that particular poet, and this is my own, perhaps. Uh, and, that, and it's for that exact reason is because innately I'm no longer thinking, well, I've read 20, page, 20 poems from this person. I, I feel like I'm understanding what they're saying by, doing, you know, by trying to take the, on some level as a reader, by trying to take the, the author out of it, um, that for me for, totally frees it. Then the poem is my poem, and it is. Every poem is everyone's poem. Every time you read a poem, it's, it's different. 
I could read a poem and a, a month later, the same poem is a totally different poem to me. It, and it, th those are my poems. And if you read the same poem and it meant something different to you, that's your poem. It's no longer the, the, the writer's. Um, so that's actually perfect. And that's exactly what I meant. That's actually a perfect example for the universal. For, for me, Thank it's you perfect. Thank you. You, you took the author right out of it. Even if the author's me, I appreciate that. Um, uh, this, uh, the, this poem in particular is, is kind of a, a quintessential example of that, I think. Uh, it's titled Memoir, uh, and these are mine, but I, I, maybe I shouldn't say that. Um, the, uh, uh, or Stafford's or someone's. Um, but it's, it's, it's called uh, uh, Memoir, and my goal is almost to write a non-memoir memoir. memoir. I, there's that anticipation if you see the word memoir. It's like, okay, this is going to be about this person, as opposed to perhaps it not being about that person uh, necessarily. <clears throat> so, uh, memoir. And even this is not about me. Not the lightning struck boy that melted from mountain into river and emptied eventually into open sea. Not the absent siblings he drew in the margins of notebooks to reassemble, excuse me, to resemble the heroes and demons he feared battling himself. Not love's fluid arc from unquenchable fire to empty language and back again until the embers never cooled or fully shattered night. Not the moment his name emigrated to memory or the fragments of storms needed to rebuild a house or the hubristic words that bowed outward toward meaning. Not even this sinuous river straightening into a life. <clears throat> my hope in that poem um, is that uh, in, on some level writing my story, I left it ambiguous enough to hopefully resonate with others. I structured it specifically that way. Um, the, the idea of creating perhaps a conversation. Um, in particular, that I, <clears throat> excuse me, by uh, setting up that way, um, so many of us were, I guess you could say, a lightning struck child, let us say, you know, the, the curiosity, the, um, the energy that, that one has, how that eventually drains into, into kind of a vague, a vague sea at, at some point. Um, how, in my case, not having siblings, other people perhaps have lost siblings, other people perhaps siblings are so much older that they didn't really have a relationship with them. So that you're left drawing the friends you don't have, the siblings you don't have, the parents you don't have, you're left drawing those on the, on, on, in the corners of uh, notebooks perhaps in school. Um, and you do that because you can't actually, the, you can't battle the demons yourself. Um, so you, you, you're creating these, these people for your life. Um, and of course, other things too, and ending it with that idea of it being a river straightening into a life. Um, so I was hoping to leave that uh, absent enough that it doesn't really necessarily have anything to do with me, but at the same time, it's actually very close to me. Um, uh, fairly similarly, a very short poem, also from this book that may or may not be from me. We haven't decided yet. Um, that was, uh, I like that. Um, I tagged it, but I think I tagged too many pages. <clears throat> when I was a child and a storm approached, others assisted their families with the shutters and shovels. Others counted the time between claps and flashes. I would cry out a list of synonyms for what was to come. Tempest, blizzard, gale, squall, cloudburst, chaos, upheaval. We were then what we would soon become. I still react in words, take comfort in their distance. Um, so on some level, that actually is, is very autobiographical. Um, in that, um, during that, the, the great uh, storm, um, the perfect storm, for those who have seen the movie, read the book, et cetera, having lived, uh, being from the East Coast and having very much lived through that, and we lost a tree and some shingles and such to it. Um, all sorts of people are battling down the hatches, et cetera. It was tearing apart the house when I was in middle school, I guess. I guess it was in the 90s. And, um, or, or, yeah, in the late 80s, something like that. And um, 
I didn't do that. I was really excited about, about the whole thing, and I didn't know how to describe it. I'm like, Storm, yeah, I got it. I know that. I don't know how else to describe this thing. So I got really excited about it, and I had a thesaurus and everything, finding out what, what else I could call this thing that was going on, um, which my parents weren't happy about. But <laughs> it... Um, but it, that made me think about the, it made me think about the, that idea of like maybe when we're younger, some, c certain things that we do, little ticks, little traits, like that might not mean anything to anyone. You know, it's not like you do that and you think, oh, I'm going to be a writer now. But the fact that maybe those little things in youth signify what you'll someday do, uh, someday be. And I ended it with that last line, which actually was where I first started it, because my, my uh, wife and her uh, never-ending... Uh, honesty, which I appreciate. Uh, I still react in words, take comfort in their distance. Uh, I, uh, she has pointed out on more than one occasion that I do seem to uh, distance myself by words. I'll as, uh, talk a good game in order to not actually say the thing you're trying to say. I uh, use the word you instead of I when describing things that I do. Oh, well, when one, or one, when one does this, blah, 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 blah. And I just thought that there might be a connection between that, because I realized I've done that my entire life, I think. I, I, place, I use words to place a distance between myself, uh, I guess, and myself on some level. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a bad thing or not, it's just you know, a trait, but I, I felt like somehow that connected, somehow gutturally that connected to, um, to that story, to, the, to a story of words. Um, so I wanted to uh, change, uh, maybe, uh, move on a little bit. There's so many things one would want to talk about, and, and obviously, and I totally talked about, about half the things that I, I would love to talk about, too. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about, though, also, was the idea of curiosity and the idea of um, the beginning of creation. So I wanted to ask quickly, where, how do you find creative inspiration? Where do you find it from? If you're going to write something, if you're going to, if you're going to start a piece of art, whatever, perhaps, for the creative people, whatever your creative medium is, where, where do you start? You know, how, how do you approach that? I don't, I don't necessarily mean, like, like I have, you know, not the, the, the practical part of it, but where do you start inspiration-wise? I just finished uh, doing about 225 projects with kids at a grade school, and I had to envision and create the projects for them in the first place, so I started by reading the books they had chose to read in each classroom. And there were, um, they were about fourth or fifth grade level books. And it was amazing approaching those books with the idea of creating physical art. It was, it just flowed. It was just so easy. For instance, The Tale of Despero. When you're reading it, it's painting the pictures in your head. And they talked about the tapestry of life and how beautiful the stained glass windows were. So what our class project was, was to create a tapestry of a stained glass window with each of the child's names that they put in mm. it. So it's like one thought in the book led to another thought. And I find that reading or poetry or words actually uh, are very inspirational for me. Mm. Starting with words, that's it, yeah. I, actually, that, that is very often the case with me also. Yeah, so, somehow finding a word that, somehow a word just inspires you, and you almost create a whole world around that, around that word, which is interesting. And I loved, um, I mean, there, there are no shortest ways of doing it. I, I do also like the fact that uh, you had referenced children, because mainly what I wanted, was gonna say, quickly say was that, to me, the, um, uh, a lot of it has to do with having uh, youthful curiosity. I think that's perhaps more important on some level than anything else. Um, and also that idea of kind of trying to foster a constant creative perspective um, to flush out the, the, the metaphors um, in everything one encounters on a daily life. I know it's, it's very difficult and sometimes actually painful, I find. But uh, as, a, as opposed to, for example, just sitting down and being like, now this is my, crea now this is my creative time. Uh, to me, trying to find, in just simple, fun little ways, um, every time you're driving down the road, looking out the window and what you see in front of you, imagining it being something else, or what else can that be? On some level, I think I look for, I try to look for metaphor almost annoyingly in everything. If I'm walking down the street, I, I look at a tree, I'm like, what, oh, and I see a bird, and I, da, 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 and I try to, I literally try to turn those into other things. I'm sorry, what are you going to? Charlie, um, please tell the name of your 
Yes, I can. <laughs> it's, uh, it's controlled hallucinations. For those who are familiar with the term, it's uh, similar to lucid dreaming. Uh, it came out uh, early this year. And uh, yeah, been, uh, yeah they, all the poems there are, are loosely, they're loosely linked by concept and by structure. So they don't have titles for that reason and are all kind of lumped under there. Um, yeah, thank you. What an excellent question. No, um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just kidding. Um, but anyway, so the, but that idea of the youthful curiosity, so like an oak branch, if you see an oak branch, let's say uh, bent by snow, you know, over a road, you know, most of the time you see that and you probably think, I hope it doesn't fall on me while I'm driving under it. But why does it necessarily have to just be an oak branch? Uh, very much like a child. Imagine being a child again. When you, you see the moon is sickled and orange, you know, in the sky, uh, uh, most, a lot of children don't necessarily just see a moon when they see that. Um, or even, um, as I say, that idea of untraining yourself. Uh, from literal thinking. I think in a way there's a cage that we put ourselves in in literal thinking. And, and, and the older I get, and you know, the more hours one works every week, et cetera, uh, and more bills one has to pay, the more, the, the, the tighter that cage gets. Um, so that's that idea, for me, that idea of constant perspective of uh, even if, I, literally even if I'm paying a bill, I'm, I, what else, on some level, what else am I doing? Um, and I think that can literally be applied to everything and little things. That doesn't mean you have to write a poem about them, but trying to approach life in a general sense, making metaphor of things, I think really, really helps. Um, and I just want to read a poem or two quickly that uh, were very, um, very much based on that, on, on little things, on individual little images that I tried to see in another manner. Uh, this is called A Clothesline in Winter. The wooden fence posts on both sides bow to weather, and halfway between earth and sky, our line slackens, brushing the coattails of one neglected cloth body against a canvas of white. What we've pinned to cloud, hoping to dry, in time clings to skin, grows harder than bone. What is it we wear when there is nothing left but rigid names for impossible, unsullied things? From a frosted window, we are dreaming a taut, connected thread and figures for the wind to make dance. Uh, a second one of that, obviously, close on in winter, it's right there, I guess, um, what I was looking at, but an, uh, another example, I just uh, sprung directly from the, almost the simplest image, the idea of a saw being wedged halfway into a tree. And there's just something about that that was, that was bothering me. You know, if someone's sawing a tree and then it just stops at that halfway point, so well before falling. Um, but obviously that's probably gonna happen at some point. So, it's, um, so I, started, uh, I started asking myself questions, like what world can I create for this image to exist in because I wanna do something with that image? Um, what could it be a metaphor for? Uh, what larger concern can I address or question uh, within the, the tiny world of this image? Um, and this is called Tree Fall. A jagged circular incision to the halfway point of broken. Then we rest a night, metal teeth lodged in the center, a quiver with song. The evanescing canopy overhead is a garden filled with birds, living and dying, both definitions of escape. Tomorrow will be an acceptance of fallen bodies. <clears throat> um, and a third, and um, on some level very different, is um, you'll see that there's this uh, birds pouring from a chimney, something that I had witnessed, in combination with um, something that Anatoly had referenced too before, that idea of either a, so, a social or political event or, or, or an opinion. Um, and that was something too, the, the idea of trying to, um, how, how do you subtly approach something that's not remotely subtle? In some, let's say, um, actually, I, I actually don't want to say, say it right now. I'd rather read the poem. And I'm going to ask you, so you can think about it in advance, what oh, historical, sociopolitical thing am I speaking of? 
actually maybe the, the couple of words before it will probably give it away, but it's called As Tattoos Fade. It begins with a few words from Elie Wiesel, author of Night, for those who are familiar. Uh, Some stories are true that never happened. Yeah, I love that, I love that line. I, I want to start all my poems with that line. <laughs> Suddenly, from all that's decayed around you, the night held inside recedes. From the boots that define your silence, a rough outline of song emerges into the torn open wound of sky, a chimney releases birds. After numbers have erased each letter, your name begins to take shape on the skin of your arm and without the need for skin. Since the sun has already learned to die but still burns our eyes, it is your turn to invent how we see morning. Um, and it, may I ask quickly, um, does anyone have a feeling for what that might be about? D is it, is it Elie Wiesel? Is it? Yeah. <laughs> should I, I should have read that at the end. Um, that actually was part of the reason I, I had purposefully put it there in case the other images within didn't, didn't speak to that directly. Um, on some level, I hoped, obviously, with, with the boots, with the chimney, with um, uh, no longer having a name but having a number and it being on your arm, I was hoping that that was in there, but in case it wasn't. I thought Elie Wiesel's uh, line was, was nice there. And it, it, so, um, it, like, in that regard, I mean, there's nothing remotely related, per se, to the Holocaust in it. Um, but I hope I was speaking direct, uh, very much directly to it on some level, but also, um, to, I guess you could say, the, if more of a historical perspective, not being in the middle of it. Um, like, for example, I had uh, visited Mauthausen, which was one of the largest uh, concentration camps um, south of Germany, um, in travels a couple years back. And, you know, just astoundingly beautiful pl uh, location. And then this, obviously, the atrocity that, that is in the middle of it, the, the, the brick buildings. And f looking at a chimney, which everyone knows, of course, what happened in the chimney. Um, I'm looking at it feeling all sorts of things, and then uh, just this huge flock of birds just poured out of it. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And that's kind of where, even though I just wrote the poem maybe a year ago and I experienced this, say, four, four or five years ago, um, just the beauty of that, because it actually was, it was absolutely beautiful. So th to me, that the, the thought, and starting with Elie Wiesel on some level, and then using the word you, when it, a you, it's almost like I'm speaking to him, or I was hoping that on some level I was speaking to Holocaust survivors, not about the Holocaust itself. You know, it's, it's, it's their turn to invent how we see morning, which is tomorrow, which is the next light, things like that. It's their turn to do that for us. Um, but I was hoping to do that in the subtlest way possible, you know, um, so that someone else can read it and think something totally differently. And uh, very, uh, very similarly, but um, in, I wanna, I'll ask you what you think this is about too. Uh, diaspora. What has not been taken from us resurrects the memory of all that has been seized. The photographs we've turned toward the wall support the wall as nails maintain their holes. Our hungry children as placeholders for the empty chairs at our table. I don't know much about vacuums or how dead stars suck us like planets into unbeing. I don't know what it means to be homeless within a home, to have the earth, yet nothing of it. Flourishing crops I cannot harvest. Mother's shadow is writing thank you cards to the bodies we cannot unexume. Their silence sits heavier than love, yet still we try to love what remains, like candlelight illuminating the heavy abyss, like how light in the darkness is itself an abyss. Perhaps the title on that one gives it away too, but uh, for those who are familiar with the term diaspora, but can anyone, does anyone gutturally feel perhaps what that might mean, the things being stolen? Yes.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and in a, in a general sense too. Uh, although that, that yeah, very much the co the concrete term of when people usually use that. For example, like the word Holocaust has its own meaning, and that's the spe specific. But um, I think I lost myself there, didn't I? But um, is it my back? No. Or also, in a general sense, means pretty much that. It, it's kind of like the dehoming very often of a people or a culture. Um, and that, to me, that idea of, uh, but that happens to everyone. I've seen people who have, let's say, lost a, lost a, lost a child, um, let's say, to, to the war. Someone just maybe 10 years ago or so that I knew that had lost someone to the war. And somehow the child that's there at the table, somehow, you know, the focus somehow shifts to the person that's not at the table. Um, so that's, in each case, you know, the, you know, a photograph being turned to the wall is, is what is supporting the house. It is what's supporting the wall. Uh, um, and... To me, that meant that seemed really similar to that idea of so many people, and not just the Jewish people, but others too. So, how many how many tribes have we misplaced and things like that? Um, that, I, that that idea of of being able to, that that the difficulty in trying to realize the beauty and love of what you do have in the face of how much you don't have. Yeah, and, and very much relating to that too. I was gonna yeah. I'm sorry. I saw it as a memorial. You know, I mean, the, the wall, you know, w when these horrible tragedies have happened within our, um, within the mm. United States, for instance, the Boston Marathon or the Oklahoma bombing, and how these memorials are instantly set up, and, I mean, they're not instantly set up, they're, they're people go there to, to, to place something that, that memorializes it, and so when you were reading that, that I just, I saw all of these places happening. Mm. That's, that's beautiful. And then, I, of course, I saw the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, but, but then after that, I you know, translated it to the others. So. And that's perfect. I could be perfect. wrong, John. No. I could be wrong. You know what? I, well, it, just, just you know, uh, I think that's perfect because, uh, b because it's getting late, and, and we should probably wrap it up in this end and ask if there are you know, other questions, general questions for both of us. I think that's a perfect way to end it. You just said that I could, that I could be wrong. You're not wrong, and you can't be wrong. <laughs> that's actually perfect. I've been trying to convince my wife that of all four years we've been together. That I'm trying to convince her that she's not wrong since she's not a poetry fan. Every poem that she reads of mine, everything is, is whether or not it's right. She tries to read everything like a poem has to be right. John, what do you mean by this image? It doesn't matter. What do you think I meant by this image? You know, or like, I really don't understand necessarily what you're getting at, but did it speak to you? Yes. Well, then there you go. You know what I mean? So that, that, that's perfect. That's the, you're, you're not wrong as a reader or writer, especially as a reader. Maybe writers could be wrong. Readers can't be wrong. Um, but I, if you don't mind, I'm always going to wrap it up so that they could ask questions. If anyone can ask questions to Anatoly and myself. Okay. I just wanted. Where's my mic? I didn't lose it. I lost it. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you very right. much, gentlemen. It was most interesting. <laughs> And this is our time for a few questions. I do have to admit I'm going home to read my poetry books a little bit differently. <laughs> and yes, my husband's been trying to tell me for a long time that I'm always right, and he knows better to do it that way. Uh, so, a smart husband. Smart husband, that's after 40 odd years, so yes he is. So after, <laughs> in 36 years my wife will tell me that, yeah, yeah, yeah. where to it go. Does, it does help, a long time helps. We'll turn it over to the guys for, to you for any specific questions you have for our gentleman here. It's really more of a comment. Um, when you said uh, controlled hallucinations was the name of the book, something about lucid dreaming. Because while you read, especially Anatoly, I get the sense that I'm in a dream because things, you're like on the cusp of things making sense. They haven't quite made sense. Things seem realistic and yet there's something other, other about it. And, um, and that's actually what I really started enjoying about your poetry was what it allowed me to let my mind wander through. I, it's like, for me, I did say it was like a jigsaw puzzle, but on the other hand, it's, um, it's a relaxing pastime too. I, I like being able to think about it and yet let it absorb too.
Thank you. Thank you. Comments? Questions? Remember that both of our lovely poets have books right back there on the table that they would be happy to sign, right? Most you all definitely. brought your pens um, for purchase, so if you are interested in reading more about them, we have some great food back there. We encourage you to take a few minutes, get to know them, look at their books. We have another question. No, just a comment. No, uh, just a question. Um, you said you wrote fiction and poetry. I do. And so what, what is it that poetry uh, speaks to you other, rather than fiction? Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Because um, they could be similar in some ways in trying to bring people in and, and get them to share an experience. So what, what does one do that the other one doesn't? Does That's that make good, sense? That's a good question. I was at the reading by Marvin Bell, a wonderful po older poet, uh, very uh, famous, and he was asked a similar question. What is poetry? So his answer was poetry is about what you leave out, whereas prose is, is not necessarily that way. Prose is all the details are in, especially if it's a longer work, if it's a novel. You keep every detail in. But, uh, poetry, though, is the essence of thought, essence of metaphor, essence of experience. So you try to get rid of all the extra parts and just keep what's absolutely necessary. For me, that's what differentiates. What would you say? I, well, although I do also write fiction, but not um, nothing like Anatoly, who's written novels and, and books worth of short stories, as opposed to myself, uh, when I write maybe a couple short stories a year at most. You know, just something only if there's something that actually is bothering me, is eating at me. You know, I'll have an idea, and then I I can wait a two months until I'm just like, God, I'm still thinking about that idea. I should do something with this, and that's that's what drives me to fiction because honestly, the care the creation of characters and plot and balancing the I guess, maybe, maybe enjoy, uh, enjoy it more. Um, having to say so much bothers me. Mm. I like, and that's why I like what Marvin Bell apparently said. I like not being able to say things. I like being able to talk around things. I like to be able to hint at things. And, so, and, and although uh, uh, fiction can be written poetically, certainly, oh my gosh, so many beautiful, beautiful writers. But it is based on what you say, not what you, what you leave out. And I find it very difficult to simply state things or to say, you know, this is a character, this is what this person looks like. This, I just find it very difficult to do that. It's kind of against my, my normal creative Im, uh, impetus. So, um, yeah, so I, uh, it's very similar. I'm not sure what I, I'm, I'm still not 100% sure what I personally gain from writing fiction yet, uh, but I think the two, just because I'm not, I don't have quite as much uh, experience, but I think, I think the two actually can speak really, really well together. I think if you do both, I think it's really good to be well-rounded on some level. It's wonderful to be really, really good at one thing, but it's also nice to have, to, to be rounded. And I think maybe the two can um, invest each other with different kinds of meaning. Maybe your poetry can actually be strengthened, perhaps by description. If, you're, if your fiction has, or nonfiction, uh, you know, has this beautiful description, maybe somehow you can, whatever, however you uh, worded that, that can actually perhaps be brought into a poem. You know, there could be images within that fiction that make sense in images in a poem. Um, you know, things like that, and maybe you, if you write a lot of poetry, maybe that poetry can help you become a good fiction editor. So you're like, you know what, that paragraph should only be half that length. I said too much. So I wonder if they can complement each other, but he certainly knows more about that than, than I do. Yeah, I would say they do, definitely. Any other questions, comments? Okay. You asked previously about the creative process mm. and how that works. And I'm a um, two-dimensional, more uh, visual artist. And lately, uh, just to go see the parade, I recently went to Southern California, went with a friend who refuses to fly. So we took the train. Well, the first mm. thing I thought of was 30 hours on the train. <laughs> but actually, it was, you know, the train Still, I knew I was still going south, still in Oregon, but it's a whole new panorama than being on the freeway. Because you know you're coming into Eugene, or you know you're, you're going to come into Shamal, you're going to go over the mountain. It's a totally different mm -hmm. experience. So even though I took pictures out of the window and they all kind of go, you know, um, <laughs> that creative part of me retains those pictures and I knew where it was and what it really was even though it was all blurry and 
and it was all running by too fast, but it was very enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So that, that's totally different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, new, new perspective. That's actually that, that's a perfect way of doing it too. Uh, that, um, um, seeing things going by at, at a speed changes the things that you're seeing, obviously, from when you're standing still. The tree that goes by at a certain speed on some level could easily be seen, literally seen as something else. And that's, so I've heard people try to do things like, well, for you know, one day a month, I, brush, I do everything with my left hand instead of right hand. Uh, people do things like that. Or you know, people that normally wear glasses don't wear glasses, um, at home at least. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one, I never see without glasses. One, um, uh, one day a year. Um, or the idea, uh, uh, the idea of, of sitting in a different place than you normally do, even if it's in your room, or things like that, and suddenly can change everything. And yeah, so this, there's something about things moving around you, well, well I guess you are moving, because you're, you're actually the one that's moving, not them. But in, that, in and of itself, is, 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 isn't, that, you know, isn't that a poem in and of itself? The fact that you're moving, but it seems like everything else is moving, but it's you. And just it's, it's somehow everything is. It's, it's almost like if you try to approach things that way, I, I don't know of a single thing that isn't isn't a poem. There isn't anything. That chair is a poem, if you want it to be. It's, it's just amazing. What an interesting interpretation. Now I know why I don't understand my daughter. <laughs> she obviously thinks with that side of the brain, and I don't. <laughs> and you do. I'm listening to you, and I'm going, I've never listened to thought about it that way. So how interesting. And thank you, gentlemen. Have a lovely rest of the evening. Everyone drive safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.